I would like to put up front a model that, for me, I consider aspirational because uh, I wasn't trained this way to think about social justice. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, so we focus our world on things that are going on inside the individual, and we tend to focus our response to victims of violence uh, on their internal symptom picture. As a national professor of public health and for the last 10 years being surrounded by the profession of public health, uh, I have been socialized and continue to uh, try to make progress to become more uh, socially justice aware and alter my thinking in towards understanding and using in my work the fact that uh, victims are not the center of why violence against women happens. Violence against women happens because of the relationships around the and the broader community attitudes, laws, and policies, entitlements, gender role expectations, alcohol. There are there's a whole context that supports the occurrence of violence against women that we can ultimately to reduce and eliminate violence against women. That's the level where change has to happen. We, we need to support victim survivors, but to keep our eye on the fact that it's not them that caused this problem. The uh, other parts, and social justice is seen in many fields. Public health doesn't own it. Law has a social justice literature. Social work does. Nursing does. We, uh, and, and you're not going to see much difference. The some of the other aspects of social justice are that we're all seeing the same people because that outer nexus of supporting our risk factors also underlines child abuse. It underlines chronic um, unemployment, it, uh, opioid crisis, the um, and violence against women. So. Social justice emphasizes looking at the broader community and thinking about how we can coordinate our efforts. And it, primarily, when you look at it from an advocacy perspective, so we can raise our voices louder. Uh, because to the extent that we segment ourselves around this shared set of val values, we're not likely to be heard. We're more likely to be uh, kicked to the curb. But in concert, our voices are much more compelling. So uh, I think that I have said most of what is important. The final issue, and I'm going to elaborate on it, I do, but let me acknowledge up front that a social justice model puts high emphasis on uh, eliminating inequity and including uh, the underserved, which means that we are uh, concerned in a, from a social justice perspective of being inclusive of multiple identities of people. More, more will be said. I can tell you my agenda in two basic things. First of all, I'd like to let's get let's get incensed together, and then we'll shift from that to let's get constructive together. Throughout this, I'm going to be carrying with me a survivor-centered perspective. I'd just like to share with you the words of the former head of the Violence Against Women Office of the United States Department of Justice. She said, survivor-centered means listening to victims and providing them meaningful choices. So I'm carrying that guidance throughout today. Right, right, right off the start, let me share with you what a significant amount of the Violence Against Women Act funds pay for in the US. There's, these acronyms are different 
but they're the same as what is present in Australia to the extent that I've been able to learn that in a four-day crash course. The, the Violence Against Women Act in the US was initially passed in 1994 as part of the Crime Control Act. So it certainly is true that sexual assault and domestic violence are crimes. However, most of us in this room do not approach the subject matter from a, a, a disciplinary background in law and justice. So for us, it, it meant that we were trying to have to fit what we did within a funding stream of what has now reached three billion dollars since 1994. We had to fit ourselves into a funding stream that focused on a criminal justice perspective. I, so let me just quickly say, here's what the acronyms are. The Domestic Violence Response Team. These are things that have been funded with Violence Against Women Act money, and then like maybe less than a third of the dollars went to victim services, prevention. Uh, here's what over half the money went to. Domestic violence response teams, sexual assault response teams, sexual assault nurse examiners. There are also forensic nurse examiners that do domestic violence injury. Um, victim compensation, domestic violence, rape crisis, specialized courts, which they're still fact-finding bodies, they're still adversarial, but they have prosecutors who are more experienced working with domestic violence or with sexual violence. And they aim, they, but they, it's important to remember this, they aim to give the perpetrator a better experience. Because the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrators, are the customers of the criminal justice system. In, the, these courts are considered therapeutic justice and they are, the aim of therapeutic justice is not to be therapeutic for the victim. It's after the fact, after the same re-traumatizing experiences that occur from a trial, then at that point, a, a specialized court tries to impose um, more relevant sanction responses such as treatment for the perpetrator most. Commonly. I want to turn our attention now to what we know about who is being served. And I, tom uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking at Griffith, uh, with where one of my lifetime colleagues is. And I'm, so I'm going to share with her some, with you, some data that Kathy Daly has provided. It's global data from all of the British-based law countries in the world. So it's uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Wales and Scotland. Take a deep breath. Victimization surveys, going directly to women and asking, I self-report, show that on an average across the world, 14% of sexual assaults I'm going to, this, her date is on sexual assault, so forgive me. 14% um, of sexual assaults are re reported to police. Okay, carve that piece of meat out. And now looking at that small piece, only one third of the piece is actually gets to the prosecutor level, finishes an investigation. So now we're down to a third of 14%. And then now for our one third of 14%, we have a third that actually gets, uh, proceeds beyond prosecution. I don't want to belabor this point, but you, you just have to envision a pipeline where a, a thousand rapes come in and one results in incarceration. Her figure for the uh, worldwide conviction rate at trial is 13% in the US, 15% globally. Only 6.5% of rapes result in someone being convicted or pleading guilty to that original charge. 
So I, I promise you that's the only professor-like thing I'm going to uh, do today. But I thought it was really important to say not only if we have a criminal, if we have a system that puts at the hub of the wheel criminal justice, we already are serving a very limited segment of the women and men and people who have been victimized by domestic and uh, sexual violence. But beyond that, the evidence is not what we would like to see about who gets our services. Because unfortunately, the numbers tell the tale that we primarily serve uh, women who, from a social justice perspective, and I say women because we primarily do serve women. We serve, and, uh, it, as it lays out uh, up here, we primarily serve. We don't serve older women well. We don't serve men well. We don't reach differently abled people well. And we are doing a much better job of reaching more educated with not poverty level income white people. Structural inequality. We, I said before, just so I'm not going to belabor it, the same set of risk factors underlie so many uh, social problems. And if the idea of intersectionality means different components of our identities, we're all, you know, we all could rattle off different aspects of, you know, uh, if I'm in this group, it's most salient to think of myself this way. But if I'm in, in another social setting, I have an identity of being part of, of that, that group. You know, I recently received feedback on a product I had submitted to the US Department of Justice, and I don't have to say anything more about who's running it and who's running the country. But um, the feedback was that I should minimize or remove the material on diversity and, and LGBT um, issues. I was really thinking about one of the primary people I'm going to have to present this work to, who is a black lesbian vice president of a system that has 10 universities in, in it. I'm thinking, like, how am I going to feel saying, well, I'm going to disregard the black part of your identity, and I'm going to disregard the lesbian part of your identity, and present you from material, with materials that you are supposed to stand behind and roll out to your students um, that disrespect, disregard these intersections. Because I know you well enough to know you don't live just as a vice president of a university system that you live your, you try to attempt to live at the intersections of your identity. We know that people who are at stigmatized intersections, especially that, that structural inequality is one, it, one of the generators. It's intimately, uh, uh, structural inequality is intimately a driver of people who are at stigmatized identities. And it is transgenerational. I really get annoyed at people who say to me, uh, uh, all people are born equal. Well, all people are not born equal. I would really choose to have been born in my family, uh, as opposed to some of the other choices, because I think it made life a lot easier for me. And looking around this room, you could all say the same thing. We also need to recognize that people who are disadvantaged socially and have live at the intersections of stigmatized identities, that our interventions don't necessarily have the same impact as they, as they would. We may affect highly educated European women differently. And it suggests, it, it's, the evidence suggests that what we do is more acceptable. Um, to those, to that clientele, as opposed to others. I'll just give you a quick example. We did some focus groups with um, one uh, tribe of American Indians with monolingual Spanish speaker uh, 
residents of the US and also with women of Anglo background. And what we found was quite interesting because uh, indigenous women would, uh, if, if you ask them, if you were raped or domestically abused, who would you go to to talk? And they uniformly said, sisters, cousins. When you ask uh, monolingual Spanish speakers, they say, oh, I would go to mother, grandmother. When you ask Anglos, that's the only group that says, well, I would just uh, go to an agency. So they're the only group that says, I would tell a stranger. Okay, so I wanted to, to let's turn our attention now to service user feedback. And this is in the United States. I don't have any reason to if, believe it differs. Um, and it's not what we would like to, uh, to, to know about. Uh, I'm going to say some things that are different from what's on this slide. About 90% of post-sexual assault victims who have contact with the formal systems say that they experienced at least one very distressing interaction with a, a member of one of those formal systems. The entire professions, criminal justice, legal, medical, clergy, tend to be immediately afterwards rated positively by victims for how they felt treated, except that the vast majority never come back a second time. So I think you have to say, did they vote with their feet? Like, the only group that tends to come back are group women who have pre-existing mental illness diagnoses. What happens when you talk to women who have sought our services at least one time? So most studies say two times. So like, we're, we're getting down to some people who are basically unrepresentative because seeking services two times, most only came once. All right, but even the ones who sought services two times say that the options that were offered to me mismatched my objectives or they presented accessibility ch ch uh, challenges. They were far away from my house. Or Annabelle took me to a place where it was next to a cemetery. And it would be the same in the US as here. Our indigenous people do not want to be near death. And, and so that it would, it, it would actually be pretty insensitive to have your services if you were hoping to serve indigenous people and have them located there. Um, so accessibility ch uh, challenges, but the more common ones are transportation, or I'm afraid to be seen there um, be because I, it, I could be hurt uh, further and lots of other reasons. Who's going to take care of my kids? I get paid by the hour. How am I going to take time off from work? Uh, they, victims say, I wasn't interested in pursuing incarceration. That's not what justice means to me. In fact, I explicitly don't want the person incarcerated, or we, we call it in the US race loyalty, um, that I'm receiving a lot of pressure from my community not to um, get someone else subject to a racialized justice system. So for last thing that people tell us is, well, you know, uh, yeah, sexual assault, physical, uh, domestic assault are really bad, but I'm a little bit more concerned right now about where I'm going to live, how I'm going to feed my kids, um, how I'm going to find a job, who's going to watch my kids while I'm trying to work on one or two jobs that are required for me to afford housing and food uh, in, you know, in, in, this, in, in this city. And, and lastly, I don't have any time. I'm lonely. I live far away from my family, and other the people in my family have their own problems. So I'm just isolated. I don't have anybody to turn to. Okay, we can have the, the next one. Take a look carefully at your forms that you have people fill out, because uh, oftentimes we have our agenda that represents what we think we would do if we were, for example, um, victims of sexual assault or domestic violence. And we say, well, I would go to law enforcement. Or if we don't say that, 
because we know too much about the traumatizing nature of that experience, we say, well, I go to a hotel, I just get the hell out of there, I pack up everything, and, and I'd, be, I'd be gone. Uh, but by doing that, we're not paying sufficient attention to the extent to which victimization presents people with losses. And these losses include their, uh, in the terms of sexual assault, loss of your reputation the shame and stigma that's attached to it. Um, in particularly domestic violence, loss of your home, uh, it can interfere with your employment, your social relationships, and most importantly, if you can't provide removal of children by protective services. It's not uncommon for agencies to describe themselves as being victim-centered, but at the same time to have this sub agenda of we want you to get protection orders, we want you to report to the police, and we want you to pursue court action against these people and the, the um, perpetrators. It, and we are working against the cultural forces and the emotional needs that make people want to return. And so we offer our agenda of services and to be really careful if we're saying it's victim-centered, then we can't sort of say, well, I really prefer to work with the ones who are gonna use the stuff that's on our main menu, and those people who want an a la carte response, they're gonna have to wait longer, or maybe will. So it's not victim-centered to say, here's the menu, but it only has three choices. Um, and the fact that you're vegan is just too bad. What do we do about this? How do we do better? Uh, here's two concepts that make sense if we're trying to go more directly to victim voice. And, we're and, and we want to hear from not just the people who attended our services twice, but we would like to hear from people who didn't reach out for services or were looking for services, but couldn't find what they were looking for, or couldn't figure out a way to access, access them. I thought that the literature would have this information when I went searching for it. What do victims want? Or even narrower than that, how do victim survivors define justice? But I, what I really mainly found were the at me too type of things, which were either what happened to me, or if they are um, less depressing, they also have the elements of, and then how I recovered, what my recovery arc from that was. But we, it, there was also another hashtag that's not as well known, which is in their words. And that one, it, it just obviously recently happened, so I haven't had time to go through it very completely, but it's getting us closer to hearing in unfiltered words how victims describe their needs, their priorities, and their goals for what would be, how they would spend the money, how they would advise us to set up our menu of services. Radical listening is super hard because it means to set aside your, your existing mental template of, well, this is what will help victims recover, or this is, this is, uh, this is what's realistic and this is what's not realistic. Um, and to try in an unfiltered way to st step into someone's shoes, to look out through their eyes, and to try to take in to your awareness the information being conveyed without trying to filter it, um, trying to sort it, trying to display it as holiday ornaments onto your, your tree. Uh, that you, your pre-existing tree. Culture, hu cultural humility means, basically, I don't know about you, 
what can I learn from you? They tell, you know, tell me about what it's like to be you. If we go soliciting victim voice, we've got to be aware of the dynamics involved. We are all powerful. We have social power. We uh, have, in most of the cases here, race privilege. Um, we, uh, and we are not currently grappling with an ongoing situ stigmatizing uh, situation. I'm not saying anything revolutionary to say this situation calls out for community-based participatory methods of program planning and evaluation. What, what that means is the comfortable thing to do is to set up in my office and have in my conference room, go out and try to put up posters and recruit people to come talk to me in my conference room out of my office building next to the cemetery. Um, it's not like really an effective way to hear the diverse voices that you, um, that you want to hear. But what does that mean we have to do? And somebody told me yesterday an interesting thing because we've tended to conceptualize it in the U.S. as we, as a movement, both DV and SV started out at the grassroots. It wasn't federally funded. It didn't have formal agencies. We created those in the 70s. And we created them by victims getting together, raising their voices. I mean, first in working in support groups and coming uh, coming to their own self-identity that it's not just me alone, this has happened to a lot of people, but then getting their voices heard as a social movement, creating social issues that then got policy attention. And that's how we, and our first services, our first shelters, our first crisis centers were all staffed by volunteers. And many of those people were also victimized themselves. So they brought their own intuition as victims, and they brought their own fearlessness that they had arrived at for advocacy to working at their uh, job. And it was like, I don't care if I'm offending you and I'm in your face because I perceive that that's part of what I owe myself and I owe the other people who are in this together uh, together with me. So, so community-based means we've, we've gotten, what's happened with, the, with all our success getting agencies, getting the funding, we went from the grassroots to now the grants say you've got to have this kind of people running your agency and you've got to have this kind of qualifications for people giving services. It's, it means that we now are more at the grass tops. You don't see job definitions that say oh, you need to have personal experience with the subject matter. So the, and, and even if we did, we're not hiring a diverse range of people so that we can be at all re re reassured that we're hearing what we need to hear. Well, what, so what do we do? We need to go out into the communities. We need to um, make connection with the naturally existing social organizations, like churches, like meeting places. And we can't just go in and say, hey, I'd like to sit down with you and talk about sexual assault or domestic violence. It's oftentimes, you're gonna you use anthropology methods. You're gonna cook. You're going to um, you're going to uh, sew or whatever the traditional activity you're, you're going to participate in the, the uh, life of the congregation, and that as you become accepted, then you begin informal dialogues. It's my experience that you first start hearing. This is what happened to my sister or my cousin, and you that you know you are getting someplace where you start to hear, and this is what happened to me. The, I've also learned that in the uh, process of doing this work, 
you build bridges because let's say you're going to a uh, going to a place of worship. Our subject matter is not, first of all, necessarily high on the agenda, and second of all, it's not necessarily acceptable to be talking about. And third, you may be going into an ins in an institution or an organization that in fact has played an unhelpful role at times in the past. Um, I mean, the, the uh, Catholic Church has apologized in Canada for the role that they played in encouraging people to stay in domestically violent situations and to basically blame, blame the, the victim. So it's an opportunity to put our issue on the radar. And that's a step in and of it. Uh, in and of itself. Let's go on um, to more forward thinking. So the first step we just covered, which is let's get some ideas at the table. And you know, at the table is a key piece of it, which is if we all just listen, but then we go back with our same people and our same policymakers, and we sit at the same tables making decisions, we're not really changing what we're doing. This is the hard thing about radical listening, because radical listening implies that it's that the voices need a seat at the table. But more than that, it's not so you can trot out and take a photo and say, look how diverse we are. Uh, would you sit in the middle, please? Um, it's so that you can say, we incorporated voices into our decision making, that they were not only, the voice is not only there, but it's part of making decisions. And that means that we had to cede some power. It's not always easy to feel um, like you're willing to do that. And now I'm going to some suggestions that is a stem from experience in psychology with the mental health treatment gap. And it's, it's known that there's many more, for example, depressed people in the world than there are trained people who can give services for depression. There will never be the money to train enough people if you're going to look at master's level or doctoral level people as being the treaters of mental illness. So the field of counseling, psychology, have had to try to think, how do we address this gap. And one, as a, there's, there's I, I would, I'm going to put forward three ideas. One is task, task shifting, one is innovation, and one is um, using efficient methods. So task shifting, what that means is thinking about new roles for us. Because we, uh, we are all highly trained and highly paid people. We take up a lot of the budget. Personnel is always the biggest budget line in the budget. How can we use ourselves to recruit community health workers, to train them to work in their sites as opposed to holding our services in our local place? How do we create materials for them to use, create training programs to use so that we can involve more, uh, more, uh, more people who are lacking the formal academic training but are superior to us in their cultural fit with their community, with their linguistic fit, with their, the respect level that they have. Um, it's also the fastest way to diversify our workforce so that we can put our money where our mouths are and, and say we are reaching the underserved through appropriately um, deployed personnel who will be acceptable. Who, who will be trusted. And I've also done a little bit of thinking about, well, who, who, who are good community health workers? Well, good community health workers are 
people who are very respected in their communities, uh, and oftentimes the, the, the suggestions for who would be good come from the community itself. Uh, be really careful assessing socioeconomic status in indigenous people, because if you use what's your house like, uh, the typical way, you know, how many toilets does your house have, and uh, what's your annual income, and what's your highest level of education, those kind of things, you will miss the fact that the person with the highest respect may be the healer. It may be the spiritual leader. Somebody who, in every other measure of social status, would not jump up to you, but that's the trusted, most respected, most successful person. So this this is what we're looking looking for. Um, we also uh, use volunteers, but there may be ways to use more volunteers. Why did I say this second? I said it second because I think it's very important when we're living our ideals that when we use community health workers to screen, to give information, to help people access other elements of the system, that we pay them. By doing that, we're creating, we create jobs, and we create more people who can um, improve their own living situation so that they become, um, they're already respected, but they give more um, stability and economic, uh, and, and they, they, we amplify their ability to be opinion leaders in their own, own communities. Okay, I'm ready to turn to deliberate uh, innovations. So uh, our models, because they were developed in the 70s, the people at the biggest risk age for victimization in the 70s were uh, baby boomers. And so we have a service delivery model of coming to, calling, making an appointment, waiting, uh, tell, coming to my office, tell a stranger, uh, being offered things like mental health interventions and adversarial justice options that don't necessarily respond to what I need. We've had, since that model was developed, we've had I said the other day, we've got X, Y, and Z. We're now, uh, Generation Z was born 2000 and after. Well, it's 2018. I teach 20-year-olds. They tell me about their date rape experiences. So I, I don't know what they're called because there isn't a letter after G because uh, they are, uh, they uh, after Z. Because the point is, people born in 2000, they're adults now. So what are we going to call the new people? These Generation Z are at the highest risk age now for domestic violence and sexual assault. They don't get their information from the telephone. They get it from their phone. They just don't get it from making phone calls. They get it from watching podcasts. They get it from going to websites. And they get it through uh, social media and text messages. We have a lot of opportunities to innovate around our, around our delivery systems. Public awareness still has currency. You, have you had the experience that corporations were willing to fund anti-domestic violence campaigns, less likely to form, uh, fund sexual assault because they view that as being nasty and don't want to be associated with it. But um, then you, there'd be posters on buses, you know, um, it's, you know, it's never right. And that kind of message, no means no. We have the opportunity now, where do ads, where do ads appear now? They appear on websites. So why don't we use the same model of going to corporate advertisers and say, we want you to for every hundred times you put your ad on a web page, we want you to, uh, and your product targets our demographic. To get corporate involvement the way we did before successfully, but place our information in different places. What about buying phones for people on our staff uh, or community health workers and develop 
um, a, a whole set of resources that are designed to be used for, you write me a question, I'll give you an answer. You write me about a dangerous situation, I'll give you a suggestion for reaching safety. Um, you're, you're seeking information about services. Here's a central number to call, to you know, call, or here's a website, a URL to go to, where you can find more information. To think about delivering uh, what we have to offer in more innovative ways, and I think that the I did sum this up by saying that we. If we reach out and put our issue on the agenda of places that can help us break social isolation because they build architecture that brings people together uh, through shared tasks like child, um, like child care or like homework or laundry, uh, safe transportation and, and, and so forth. If you look at your system now, you may see that you have defaulted into something that was formally made by law in the U.S., which is a wheel that has as its a hub criminal justice. And then we are, as service providers, the spokes of the wheel, and we find ourselves operating and funded to operate by feeding people down the spokes into the criminal justice hub. What I'm suggesting is that we reconceptualize the hub as being centered on victim survivors and that we focus on not only having the spokes uh, be related to the needs of survivors but also think about the outer circle of the wheel that binds us together in a joint effort of holding the wheel up and making it Turn. There's many fields that are calling for the same idea, re-centering, victim-centering. It's a buzzword throughout, uh, throughout a number of disciplines, so this is not like um, super innovative, I'm just emphasizing it. Before I finish with my last slide, which is colorful, uh, I, I'd like to uh, briefly say two things. One is, my my alternate shtick that I do is on restorative justice. So when I, what you're hearing me say about criminal justice, I'm not saying victim survivors dismiss justice. They want justice, they have justice needs. It's just that often they feel they don't want fact-finding justice. They don't want adversarial fact-finding justice. And so I'm also very interested in advocating for justice innovations and alternative choices that lack of fact-finding. They're designed for people who want to move forward, who recognize that there's been a problem, that there's been violence issues, and want to move forward, who recognize in the sexual assault case that there's a wrongdoer and a harmed person. So innovative, um, Innovative justice is important to me, but I think we need to take it out of the hub because we cannot assume that it's any more important than the other needs that victims have. The um, other point I want to make before going to my color slide is that uh, is called assets focus. I, I've told the story before that I was working with a tribal community in Alaska, and I brought in a colleague who specializes in family strengthening using family group decision making that is a restorative type approach. And she said, so we have to get the family members together, and I thought, hmm, you know, have you visited an Alaska village because, um, you know, there's a lot of problems. And she said to me, even the most dysfunctional family has functional members. And so it's our job as professionals to help constitute the group of people who can be a support circle 
it's our job as professionals to go into a community and do assets mapping. And assets mapping isn't just where's a rape crisis center, where's a domestic violence service 300 kilometers away. It's what exists already in the community that could support people if only we helped redeploy their agenda in, 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 in part. There are high-tech ways of doing this, too. Somebody told me yesterday that they were just getting ready to start a mental health support group for sexual assault survivors. And uh, I, I said uh, two things. One was, I really, I, I don't find personally taking on a mental health patient identity as being empowering to me. And uh, so it, I would prefer to see these groups obviously include mental health concerns, but to be more broadly described. But also, at the same time you introduce this face-to-face, -face, I'd really like to see that you use WhatsApp or something like that, where you can use your personnel to um, monitor, to um, be the, what do you call it, facilitator of an online that is going to, that can help us reach these rural areas better and it can be private, you can have to have a password. Somebody, uh, I think it was Annabelle, told me, well, you know, that's a problem because there's areas where there isn't good uh, cellular signal service. And I said, taking a social justice perspective, that would suggest to me that you need to get together with other social justice organizations and demand that uh, access to modern communication be better distributed around the country. Because otherwise, think about all the things that we can benefit from in urban areas that we just have to write up in it. As I understand the country's priorities, it's not acceptable to say we're just right off the rural areas. So um, I would like to see modern technology used, but the means to use it would have to be a high priority. All right, finally I've gotten to the end. <laughs> this is not uh, the best example, but I didn't have time to redo it. So this is a wraparound care method. It's a coordinated community response, but rather than having justice at the hub, it has the children and families. And it's uh, dividing the community service into sectors. And it lists out, you'll be able to get this slide after the fact. It, it lists out the kind of services that fall within each of the sectors. What's missing is for me to put a section in here that's the whole criminal justice law enforcement sector, uh, which which uh, actually should be here for children and families too. This slide makes uh, a couple of important points as a public health person. And by the way, I've been told that public health has been essentially defunded here. That was very upsetting to me because public health, a good thing about that profession is we do bring this multi-level perspective going from more individually oriented services to community level to societal policy and legislation level. Um, the continuum of care, we, we can tend to get so wrapped up in offering individual services that we don't get ourselves all the way to the other end of the continuum, which is not just preventing bad things from happening, but also promoting healthy behavior. And, uh, and uh, finally, there's the elder circle here, which in this case is at the state level, as appropriate since I am here speaking in Queensland and not in other states of the country.